let's talk the military. Oh, actually, I'm wearing a Coast Guard US USA Coast Guard uh, shirt. Got it from a you know PX uh, in uh, Virginia. My sister, active military. Well, I guess she's almost ret she's retired now. Yeah, retired as a lieutenant colonel. I don't know, whatever she retired. Yeah, lieutenant colonel. So you know. Go on this thing with her. She buys a shirt, you know, blah blah blah. Because actually, I, I the only PX I can go into uh, PX because I served four years in the Air Force. But um, I'm also a, a, um, a part of the uh, the Veterans Administration thing. I'm, I have a disability. Anyway, that, so I go to I can go to uh, VA hospitals, and then when they have their little PX store, they I can I can buy you know I can buy stuff from there. I bought several stuff I like military gear. I mean, let's talk to me. Oh, I got my Samuel L. I've been watching a lot of Samuel L. Jackson lately, you know, on video. My, I've been watching, like, The Negotiator. I know Kevin Spacey. It's a great movie. I love The Negotiator. Samuel L. Jackson, one of his best, best roles. I really, really liked him. But let me turn my hat on backwards. I got this from someplace else. Samuel L. Jackson, look. Yeah. Because he also played that uh, other kinds of rules. I mean, I don't know, whatever he played in the military. You know, people play these kind of roles. But real life roles, those are difficult to play. Um, let me go back. This was in like, uh, what was it? About 1973, I think. I was in the Air Force from 1970 to 1974. I think in 1973, I was, I was uh, well, first of all, when I first came into the Air Force, I was trained about every, all, all airmen, all Air Force people go to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. And then I was up in Shepard Air Force Base, which is the other, upper part of Texas, you know, by the Colorado, whoever border up there. And, um, for my phase two training, and that was like a lab technician, so it was like, like six hours a day for like, what was it, nine months? Oh, for, it was a long time, you know. Um, and then I went for my phase two training at, uh, at um, in Ohio, right past the Air Force Base in Ohio. Uh, that's, um, uh, you know, that's in Ohio. It's close to, uh, uh, no, Dayton, Dayton, close to Dayton, Ohio. And then I was finally, um, uh, stationed at McGuire Air Force Base, which is under the, again, under the, the Military Airlift Command, the MAC Command, Military Airlift Command. That means they, they airlift a lot of uh, equipment. That was in New Jersey. It's surrounded by Fort Dix, a little old base surrounded by Fort Dix, which is a huge Army base. Anyway, so um, what's interesting about that is that military air, it means that back then, you know, I can, because of military airlift, they would go all over the world. In fact, I knew how the Vietnam War was going day to day. You know why? Because that's where the, all the blood, you know, went to, that, that was the blood supply. I was a lab technician. Went, there was a special unit. Um, I wasn't there, he was in the dispensary. But there was a special unit to send the blood that, that the soldiers needed to Vietnam. So depending on the level of the amount of blood that was going on, I knew exactly how the war was going. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, so I was, I was there. Um, you know, but in the military, you can take planes any place. So one time I took a flight because it's free, you know, I took a flight to uh, Colorado Springs where the uh, Air Force Academy is for, you know, the office and stuff like that. This, I think it was in 73. And uh, I, I forgot why I was there. I just, this is, this is a long time ago. I forgot why I was there, but I was, maybe I was just hanging out, chilling, but I don't, I don't know why I was there. Um, but I know there was some sort of weird conference. Not weird, but just some sort of conference. But I met, um, at the time, was uh, Colonel um, uh, Daniel Chappie James. And he became, uh, shortly thereafter, yeah, I think he was a colonel then, a full bird colonel. But shortly after, he became the first uh, black uh, general of the uh, of the Air Force. There had been other black generals in the military. I think uh, Benjamin O. Davis, and well, there was a bunch of other. Anyway, anyway, but he's famous. He's a famous guy. He's uh, uh, the Davis uh, uh, chap, well, chappy. Well, colonel. You know, I shouldn't say ch I should general. Well, for me, it was colonel. <laughs> colonel, uh, colonel, um, the colonel. He, uh, you know, he was he flew with the. He flew with the Tuskegee Airborne. He flew, he flew bomber missions and stuff like that in Vietnam. He did some other stuff like that. He was famous. I think his most famous thing is that he was in Libya when, when Gaddafi and, his, and, 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 and those uh, generals uh, kicked the U.S. Out of, out, of, out of Libya. He, he actually faced uh, Gaddafi down. Something happened and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you have to read it for yourself. I'm not, that's not what I really want to talk about. But at that thing, for, I don't know what his position at that thing was. I don't know. I think it was like some sort of weird public. Of, I don't know what it was. All I know that that particular, whatever the big conference was, he uh, drew up, uh, he asked a bunch of us airmen, black airmen, to come to a 
meeting, a, a, a gathering with him. It was, a, it was, I had to say it was under 30. It wasn't like, it wasn't a lot of us. It was like maybe 30 at the most, 20, 30. I can't really remember. But we, I, oh, I clearly remember we was in some sort of little, little, not even a dining hall, some sort of, it was a little room. Uh, and so he was, he just had an informal talk with us. Plus black airmen, because he was an airman. He was a big time colonel. Um, and the, the thing about that, it was interesting because one of the, I remember two things that he said. Um, he said that when he was younger, um, and uh, he, you know, his, his father, said, some kids call him nigger or something like that. And his father had told him, you don't worry about them. You keep on doing what you do. And one of these days you're going to be in a car and there are people going to be calling you names, calling you nigger, and you just roll up the window and you won't be able to hear them. Interesting. And then the other thing he said that stuck with me, he said that, uh, I guess he was maybe thinking of retiring, was going to be, he was, uh, he'd been fighting, he'd been in the military since World War II, so I guess he was whatever. And he said that he, when he retired, he wanted to go to Africa. He said Southern Africa. I remember saying Southern Africa to train um, Africans how to fly planes. I'm, I'm telling you, this is what this man said to a group of us. <clears throat> Those are the only two techniques I remember. Now the reason why I bring this up is because um, I was listening to uh, um, you know, the Democracy Now. I do have a, a full. Disc I have a history of Democracy Now. Don't, don't worry. You know, big time. And they was reporting that the United Arab Emirates uh, had a had a had a uh, they had mercenaries, um, uh, U.S. ex U.S. soldiers or whatever, or mercenaries in that thing doing some plot against something a few years ago, whatever have you. And then um, um, I remember when, when I was in the Air Force, again, this is McGuire Air Force Base um, in, in, this, in the early 70s, they, 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 they were training Saudi Arabian um, pilots. Because I remember they would have the patch, it Saudi, said Saudi Arabia right there, so it said Saudi Arabian Air Force. So this is in the 70s that, we would, uh, that the U.S. was training pilots in Saudi Arabia. So then I'm going to try to put all this stuff together. And so now you have, you know, Saudi Arabia's bomb in Yemen for whatever reason. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the report that Democracy Now! was pulling, was saying it was that the uh, UAE, they, they were bombing, they, would do, they were assassinating people from Yemen, also political leaders from Yemen. It, it was really kind of kind of strange. But then I, uh, a few years ago, I was on YouTube, wherever it is, um, they had this, re not report, but there was something saying that the, a lot of these um, um, uh, white Southerners were, were says Southerners. I don't know why. Says so, so I'll just say white people, white men, were going into into the into the military to get training. But more importantly, that if they survived the military, that means they would be trained and they could, you know, they could do whatever they did. And then I was thinking, remember, this is uh, during the first the Bush Gulf War. This is when I heard all this stuff. This, this is the Bush, this, the second Bush Gulf War, baby Bush W's um, Gulf War. Um, they the what, what, what was happening is, remember, they recruited, they took a lot of people from the reserve units. So these people had jobs in their areas, but when they would go to reserve and they go one or two tours, but they would lose their jobs. They would be no, but when they come back, they come back no jobs. No, they come back no jobs because, uh, again, my, my sister was, uh, was, was the nurse and um, she handed the wounded warriors, you know, coming back. So there's a lot of PTSD, much more damage people than people think these ex-soldiers or whatever I know there's reports about people's suicide whatever but there's a lot more just just damage you know mentally damaged from if you kill a lot of people you kill people from a distance, even your drone pilot you kill people from a distance it affects you it affects your 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 body luckily for me well yeah what's gonna happen anyway um you know I was a medic so I was saving lives. I wasn't trying to kill nobody. You know what I mean? In fact, the most radical thing I ever did, I went out for pararescue, which which you which was it's like the elite things for for the for the uh, for the Air Force. You know, you, you have your Green Berets for the Army, you have your SEALs for the Navy, but you have pararescue for for the Air Force. And anyway, and they go and do that to save lives. But you learn how to fight, whatever have you. But I'm not a fighter. I'm a healer. Anyway. Um, so when these folks come back, they don't have jobs. So what happens is they've been be, being, since they have military service, they have these jobs. A lot of these folks, especially these little towns, they get recruited into the, here we go, to the police force. 
right? Now, the job, a soldier and a policeman is two different kind of mentality, two different kind of jobs. You, you know, it's, it's like, I'm a soldier, but I'm a medic. That's a, a medic is different than a, than, a, than a boom, boom fight. It's just a different, and it's a different mentality, you see? So if you take a soldier and you make him a police person, and that person, soldier is up there shooting people all the time, you know, or that's the, when you point a rifle, and if you're a military, if you're a soldier, if you point a rifle, you shoot. Okay, if, if you take that same thing and, and you're, you're a policeman, these police, I always see these cop shows, you know, like I said, you know, and they meet them, they point, I guess it's some sort of Hollywood thing, I don't know what it is. You point, you point a gun, you, you don't point a gun unless you're ready to shoot. Let's put it that way. You know, unless the guy's pointing a gun at you. Okay, so I'm saying this all to say, so we have a situation where you've got a lot of damaged soldiers coming back to join the police forces, right, but still with a soldier mentality, with no... Uh, training really. In fact, these folks, my, my a friend of mine, well, a friend of mine, my, my business partner, uh, he used to be an ex-cop. Well, he was, the, he was a cop, and and he was saying that with the, the, the situations of all his killings, whatever, had cop killings. They said these folks need to be evaluated every six months. They need a psychological evaluation every six months. That's what his his suggestion was. You know, there's a lot of other people have suggested. I'm not in that that realm, but I'm saying this to say with these mercenaries running around, you know. Um, ex-soldiers, and that this group here, you know, you have the black, the, the you know, Betcha DeVos's brother own, uh, he deals with this black water thing, you know, with these ex-mercenary soldiers, and they, they, they want to now uh, privatize armies and, and pay them a lot of money, whatever it is, I, you, you get all that stuff. But that mentality, uh, you know, some people, black people say there's race soldiers, look, these are just damaged people that happen to have guns that don't, they, that they don't have to take, you know, somebody was saying, a, a cosmetologist, you know, probably does your nails, they have to have, their, their, their license is much more stringent than be a, to be a, a cop, you know? So with this whole militarization, I'm calling it militarization of society. Cops coming back, uh, uh, having wars all over the place. We have in Africa, there's this, you know, under Barack Obama, it's all, over 900 areas of presence in all of Africa for soldiers. You know, you you got the you got the British, of course, they've always had that kind of thing, spies and soldiers. They're the French, same thing in Africa. Now you got the Chinese coming to Africa with all that stuff. So, I mean. The world is being militarized, and people don't really understand it. They'll go and did, as soon as you say something like, I don't know, look. So that's what's troubling me. That, that's why I had to say something. This has been bothering me for a very, 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 very long time. Because actually, I think Daniel, Ch uh, Daniel Chappie James, when he passed, he was a general. When he passed, I mean, he was the last person. I'm, I'm not sure if this is accurate. This, but he's the last person that had his finger on the nuclear button. You know, whereas right now, um, it, it goes through a whole lot of process, but then back then there was one person that can do it. I think he was the last person. Anyway, he I think he, he passed like maybe two years after he retired, so he never got to Africa to, to train any soldiers. I, I'm not one for conspiracy or something like that. He died of a heart attack, they, they say, but you know, he had heart problems before, so I don't know. Yeah, whatever it is, all I know is that you got a lot of damaged people, heart attacks, and not running around here now that, that are now uh, pointing guns, and and their only orientation to point a gun was to kill people in foreign lands, kill people that don't look like them. So there you have it. Opinion from me, T from the Patterson's taking the train to Tibet, letting you know what I only suspect.